some time ago, I found this note. I found it on a number three train in New York City. I noticed it at 42nd Street Station on the way to Harlem, which is where I live. Here is a map of that journey. I took a picture of the note because I thought it was interesting and, in its own way, beautiful. Then my housemate, who is called Erica, and whom I was riding the train with, asked, are you going to phone the guy? I wasn't sure. I asked, who do you think Raymond is? She gave me a funny look. The reason I want to ask this question is because for a while now I've been making pieces about people. These pieces are about people I encounter in the world, in more and less usual ways, and their experiences, usually in relation to the experiences of others. So this note presented a promising opportunity. Raymond looking for work. What kind of work? Perhaps it's work that, as a musician or somebody who writes essays, I could engage in with Raymond. Where might that kind of situation lead? And what kind of story might there be to tell about it? But these pieces are also about something else. They're about people who encounter people, who have ideas about people, who know or feel or suspect or hope or remember things about people. At root, they're pieces about the process of people seeking to understand others. And in them, I try to work through the leap of faith, the speculation that I think happens when one person looks another in the eye and says, I understand you. As I procrastinated this phone call to Raymond, I realized that something interesting was happening. The longer I postponed calling Raymond, the more people I asked who Raymond could be. And the more people I asked who Raymond might be, the richer the possibilities for who Raymond could be became. <laughs> the question then gradually revealed itself as a simple way of setting up new relationships between people that tell something about the way people approach people. It tells something about the possible horizons for another person's being that we imagine for ourselves. Who is Raymond is as much a question that asks, who do we want Raymond to be? And from there, a question that asks, who are you? And that asks, who am I? I like to think of what follows then as research for a later piece about Raymond, as a document of our encounters with Raymond that precede our ever meeting. I think of it, if you like, as a work in progress presentation, or a prelude, or a prequel. But I also think of it as already a part of that later piece, and as an exemplar of the piece that precedes every later piece by anybody. The hopeful window in which possibilities proliferate, in which the real has yet to emerge, and in which thought configures all scenarios as equally delicately likely, each as but one fantastical circumstance among potential others. Maybe what and how we dream matters. In the weeks that followed the finding of the note, I asked many different people the question, who is Raymond? They gave many different answers. I had assumed Raymond was a man probably African-American, probably living in Harlem, and probably with a good reason for not being able to seek work more conventionally. Everybody disagreed. <laughs> One person thought Raymond was Creole. Somebody else thought, based on the handwriting of the note, that Raymond was a woman. One of my professors observed that the note is entirely devoid of punctuation. So, though most people I showed it to read it as Raymond is looking for work, he pointed out it might also be Raymond looking for work. Not a solicitation, <laughs> but an offer. Raymond as a potential employer. <laughs> My composition teacher wondered if it might not be Raimundo, a Hispanic New Yorker without papers. Taking into account 
these varied and preliminary imaginations, one might suppose that Raymond could look like this, or like this, or like this. <laughs> we might presume that this could be Raymond, or this, or otherwise this. Now, though Raymond could be any one of these people, and Raymond could even be various permutations of multiple of these people combined, Raymond is very unlikely to be all at once, like this. <laughs> It was at this point that I began to realise that unmoored guesswork was not in itself likely to help me arrive at a coherent sense of who Raymond could be. I decided to set up a systematic framework. I would open-mindedly and energetically follow whatever trail of clues the world exposed that resonated with the note for two full months, until early May, documenting this process carefully in writing, on record, and in still and moving images. At this point, I would cease my research and allow the gathered leads to coalesce into a narrative, a process that would necessarily involve favouring certain data over others, a process that I would account for transparently at the project's end. Once that narrative emerged, I would present it as clearly as possible in the form of a simple piece of music theatre. With this presentation finally formed, I would call Raymond to test the accuracy of my narrative. With that phone call, the sequel to this prequel would begin. Towards the end of March, I met with a mentor, who suggested I consult the internet. And together we looked at Raymond's phone number. <laughs> Raymond's number does not begin with any of the five New York City area codes. 212, 646, 917, 347, 718. Instead, it begins 225, which, it turns out, is a Louisiana number. Perhaps, as one of my early interlocutors speculated, Raymond was Creole after all. The internet tells more than just that the number is from Louisiana. It tells it is from a little place called Denham Springs, and that the number is registered to somebody called John Shiver. This seemed very strange. When I looked up John Shiver in search of an email address, I was doubly puzzled. John Shiver it transpires, is dead. Here is the obituary for John Shiver from the Baton Rouge publication, The Advocate. Without delay, I looked up the names in the obituary and found email addresses for two of Shiver's grandchildren, Jennifer Adams and Blake Martinez. I sent them both a short email explaining my interest in their grandfather and asked them if they could confirm his passing. Ooh. I recently came across a note with a telephone number on, on the New York subway. Uh, the number had a Louisiana area code. When I looked up the number online, it led me to a record for a certain John W. Shiver. So it summarizes what we've been chatting about. <laughs> At this point, without much hope of a reply, I began to write a requiem for John Shiver, which I thought appropriate according to my research objectives and which might at least be a productive way to aesthetically resolve the avenue of the investigation should it prove fruitless. A day later, an email arrived. Dear Joe, it, it was, was a strange, strange surprise to receive your email and I was in two minds about replying. I spoke with my family and they told me to follow my gut feeling. So I did and here is my response. You are right that my grandfather is not with us anymore, but there are not many days that I don't feel his presence somehow. Like when I passed through the neighborhood I grew up playing ball with him or on Lake Poncher train where I would fish on the weekend with him and my dad. There is no grave. 
My aunt asked the obituary not to report that the Coast Guard called off the search before they found him. I was in military service October 2011 to April 2012 and did not witness the death of my grandfather firsthand. It is a strange thing to grieve far from home and sometimes it still does not feel real. The East Coast is far, but if you ever pass through Louisiana let me know. I would be happy to show you around and talk about my grandpa. Oh. Oh, All the, the best, best with your project, project. Blake, Blake Martinez. Martinez. I wasn't exactly passing through, but Blake's email was intriguing enough to make the trip. The next weekend, I flew to Louisiana. Blake was kind enough to take the day off work to drive me around Livingstone Parish, which is where he grew up. And it turned out he sounded nothing like the electronic voice you just heard. <laughs> You'll hear Blake later. Main Street is home to dozens of antique dealerships. Blake's grandmother, John Shiver's wife, had owned one of the dealerships on Main Street. When she passed away in 2006, John sold the business, bought a boat, and spent more time than ever on the lake after that. Around lunchtime, we pulled into the 14th largest Bass Pro fishing store in the world, which was the only part of contemporary Denham Springs mentioned on Wikipedia until an edit was made to the page in April 2016. Inside, there were catfish, gar and trout, and rods for catching them, and t-shirts to wear while you do it. There were also speedboats, a man-made river replete with rapids and a waterfall, guns, and a shooting range. John had given up meat on the advice of his doctor when Blake was a teenager, and once, when they came here together, they argued about whether this made him a vegetarian. Despite Blake's protest, John maintained that because fish was not real meat, he was a vegetarian. <laughs> and besides, he only ate what he called himself. As we took turns at the shooting range, Blake told how trout stocks began to fall after the massive floods following Hurricane Katrina in 2005 and have taken a hit with every wet winter since. And how serious fisher folk now go further east to warmer waters for their trout fix. John was serious. Our final stop that afternoon was John Shiver's last known address, also in Denham Springs. It is a very large house on a small road on which youths drive golf carts, behind which freight trains rumble by in the night, on a famous line that runs from the south to the northeast of the country, and which bums often ride. I knocked to see if its current residents could tell me something about John I didn't already know, but there was nobody home. Blake pointed out where John's boat had stood on the drive, told me briefly about the accident in the Gulf of Mexico, but without much detail. Evening fell, and he suggested we drink at his favorite bar in New Orleans. We did some talking there on camera. I would say I knew him well. I knew him, I guess, you know, I mean, with grandparents, you only know like part of the story, I guess you'd say. But here and there, I guess, you know, when he was watching us, he would give little insights into his life that I thought were remarkable because, you know, he grew up in a very different world than I'm from. Um, he spent a lot of time roping cattle. Cattle was a big business up until the 60s. So his father, uh, you know, bred cattle. But in any case, that's actually, you probably don't want to know about that because he didn't consider that important is what matters. He had dreams outside of Livingston Parish. I don't know. This is something I think about a lot because I know he's not here, but I don't feel like he's gone. He's somewhere. I feel it. I know it. I know it as well as I can know anything. And he always told me he had a, a particular affinity for New York because since we didn't have a baseball team, he'd follow the Mets. And I don't know why that seems relevant, but I do feel like 
there's a connection there that he never really got to explore. We talked like this until late. Blake didn't say it in so many words, but the impression he gave of his grandfather was of an adventurous man who, newly independent following the death of his wife and the coming age of his grandchildren and children, had little reason to remain living alone in a giant, empty, suburban home. Thinking about the decline of fish stocks in the south and the lure of baseball and a bright new life in the east, I began to feel the stirrings of a troubling question. Who says John Shiver is dead? Nobody and nothing but a flimsy, unaccredited article online. An article whose content, as Blake told, was redacted even before publication. Not here, but not gone. Blake doesn't quite dare say it, but I think we think the same. John Shiver lives. John Shiver went to the city, and now he's riding the subway in search of an off-the-books job, and he has a new name. The Requiem I wrote a week earlier had been premature, and in the night that followed my day with Blake, it became a song of longing wonder. I sang it the next morning at St. Jude the Apostle Catholic Church, 9150 Highland Road, outside Baton Rouge, which is where Shiver's memorial service was held. I would have preferred to sing it at John Shiver's graveside, but because there is no grave for John Shiver, I sang it instead in the car park. It deals with the arc of my research and also with John's new life. Today I will accompany my former self on the digital organ. <laughs> versions of this story I could have tried to tell, other narratives that might have coalesced. None would have been as rich, but other Raymonds were plentiful between March and May 2016. There was a man of that name my flatmate Erica met in Harlem, who had just completed a 25-year stretch in prison. There was a woman called Monda, whom I met in tears at the Fulton Street subway station. There are half a dozen other candidates I recorded in my Raymond diary. So how could I be sure that I should tell this story and not any other? This is the result of a trinity of discoveries that occurred in quick succession after returning to New York City and whose resonances with John's tale, I contend, are of indubitable significance. The first discovery was a poem. I've always wanted brook trout 
for breakfast. Suddenly, I find a new path to the waterfall. I begin to hurry. Wake up, my wife says. You're dreaming. But when I try to rise, the house tilts. Who's dreaming? It's noon, she says. My new shoes wait by the door. They are gleaming. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. The second discovery was at the last town the train line that runs behind John Shiver's house passes through on its way east out of Louisiana is called Independence. Originally named Uncle Sam, the town was built as the railroad was laid and remains to this day a testament to American audacity and migrant fortune seekers just like John. Its population has been in decline for decades. The third discovery was that St. Jude, the very saint of the Apostolic Church where Shiva was memorialized, is the patron saint of lost causes. Because his name was similar to the traitor Judas Iscariot, few Christians prayed for his intervention, and St. Jude was forgotten. In the late 1800s, in an effort to recuperate his legacy, the church made Jude a guardian for the lost, and a representative for those searching for impossible answers. He is believed to have been a vegetarian. <laughs> Finally, it remains to disclose that the poem of the first discovery is by the American writer Raymond Carver, and it's called Looking for Work. <laughs> a pay on to Fresh Beginnings, it was published as part of a collection called A New Path to the Waterfall. According to Amazon, the collection charts a human journey. It is about memory and leave-taking, and lives on as a record of Carver's approach to death. It was early May, the narrative was fixed. All signs pointed to its fidelity. The prelude was done. It was time to call Raymond. Hi, is that Raymond? Hello? Ha <laughs> ha